Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that we can be here to worship you and sing your praises, God. And I pray we'll have open hearts and minds. And, and Lord, I pray you come and deal with us. And Lord, when we leave this place, God, let us know that it's been you that's dealt with us. And, and God done something in our lives. Help us now. Come back and get us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 When my life world is ended, I'm across the swelling tide. chapter 10, Daniel's visited by an angel. Um, but to tell you the truth, if you look at the description, he looks a lot like the Lord Jesus Christ there in the book of Revelation chapter 1. So it might have been a pre-incarnation uh, appearance of Christ. Very likely. Most people think so. So do I, actually. But this heavenly being comes and uh, Daniel kind of passes out. I mean, <laughs> and, and you know, it's funny. Uh, the times that I have felt really, really close to God, uh, I've been very humble. Very humble. 
Uh, I didn't feel like standing up staring God in the face or shaking my hand in his, uh, you know, my fist in his face or anything like that. I felt very humble. And so Daniel, he kind of passes out in verse number 10 and says, And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. So he's there, he's there in all fours. And he said unto me, verse 11, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that, that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee uh, am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Now, I can see why. Heavenly Father, help us now. Help us to be greatly beloved in your eyes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, this is rather late in Daniel's life. Daniel is probably in his 90s by this point. Toward the end of the book, he's an old man. Uh, he didn't go back with the children of Israel to the land. He was too old to make the journey. But he was still praying and he was still repenting and he was still confessing the nation's sin and, and praying for his brother in the nation of Israel. And Daniel had a very uh, interesting life. Daniel was a slave at one point. You realize when Nebuchadnezzar came, he took those people as slaves to Babylon. And then... Because he was a smart young man and seemed to have a lot of promise, they uh, they put him into what would now be a, a cultural reprogramming pro, uh, uh, process. So he became a candidate for that program. And they tried to teach him uh, uh, Chaldee and tried to teach him all the magic and all the astrology and all the stuff they had. And eventually he became one of the wise men of Babylon. Even though he was a a man of a different nation, uh, somebody that came as a captive. And surprisingly enough, he became the head wise man and advisor to the king. And multiple kings. He advised Nebuchadnezzar, he advised his son, he advised the Persians when they came. He became a prophet. He became actually a president, which was like a, a senator or a congressman or something. Probably what we call him. He got in charge put in charge, no matter how he became the, the head guy under the king at one point. In his life, he was tested. In his life, he was consulted. And at one point, he was even feared by people who didn't worship Jehovah God. Why do you think they got him in the lion's den? Because they was afraid of him. This was Daniel's earthly reputation. But my friend, I'm here to tell you today that no matter what your reputation down here on earth is, in heaven, you have a reputation with God also. The trick is, is to make your heavenly reputation match your earthly reputation and both reputations be good. Now, you're living like the devil, you ain't got a very good reputation up in heaven. People may like you on the earth, but it don't matter. If you're living like the devil, God ain't going to praise you. He's certainly not going to call you a man greatly beloved. But he called Daniel that. That's, that's something coming from the Lord Jesus Christ. Wouldn't you love to get to heaven and God said, you're a woman of greatly beloved or you're you're a, a man that's greatly beloved, or you're a child that's greatly beloved. Wouldn't that be a blessing to you? To have Jesus say that? There's three things that made him a great beloved man in God's eyes. Let's look at the greatly beloved part. Turn to Psalm number 60. Psalm number 60. Psalm number 60. Daniel wasn't the only one that was beloved. 
Thank God God's had a lot of people that he thought a lot of. Psalm number 60, verse number 4 and 5. Psalm number 60, verse 4 and 5 says, Thou hast given a banner to them that fear thee. Now, uh, a banner. Uh, we're going to put up a banner of flags up on the, the fence for this week, coming weekend. Uh, this is a banner, really. And, and you've seen those little things up uh, uh, that they sell at ball games. I guess they still do. Free service, but they know ball game. Little little triangular flag, you know, it has the name of the team. And every time they they hit a, a home run or score a touchdown, you, yeah, you know, you wave your you wave your banner. Well, God gives a, a a banner to those that fear Him that it may be displayed because of the truth. Salah. That thy beloved may be delivered. Save with thy right hand and hear me. I want to say about the beloved of God, according to this passage of scripture, they fear God because they have displayed the truth in their life. Displayed the truth. You know, someone that uh, is a fan of their team, you know, uh, uh, I think of the people that, that rooted for the, uh, the Cubs for years. I mean, the Cubs couldn't win nothing. I mean, they never could get to the... And then finally, one year, the Cubs got to the World Series. You know, everybody, yeah, you know. But you ask a Cubs fan, you know, back before then, and they would say, yeah, but they're my team. They're my team. They're my... They, they, they were a fan of the team, even though they didn't get up and win the, the whole enchilada, as they say. And you know what? Sometimes as a Christian, we have to be... because. Because favor of, of God in the world kind of comes and goes. Right now, right now there's somebody uh, pushing to uh, take down all the uh, statues of Jesus. And, and uh, there's an a atheist group and uh, they, some guy on the YouTube said, I watched the video, some preacher up in Seattle, he's up there. And they said next they'll, they'll get the cross. Well, they're already attacking the cross. Mm -hmm. In Blainsburg, Maryland, where I grew up, there's a there's what they call the Peace Cross. As you go across the border into Washington, D.C. on the Rhode Island Avenue, uh, you've got one direction is Hyattsville. Uh, you're coming from Blainsburg, and over here is uh, uh, Riverdale. And uh, as you go around that little circle, and of course straight forward is into the D.C., you've got this big concrete cross standing right in the middle of this circle, and it's to memorial lies Christian soldiers that died in World War I. And there's an atheist group in Maryland that wants that torn down. They successfully got the, the, the county was taking care of it for years, Carroll County. And they, uh, I don't know, that's Prince George's County, actually. And they got Prince George's County to quit taking care of it. And, and so some veteran gr groups came along and they said, we'll take care of it. And they said, no, it's got to be torn down. And so they're, uh, I think they won the case to keep it up. But the cross is already being yeah. attacked. And, and you know, a, a concrete cross, you know, it, it's not a sacred object. It doesn't really do anything. But it reminds people that there were Christians that went to a war and fought for the freedom of these dumb atheists <laughs> to try to get the cross torn down. It's kind of a weird thing. And they displayed the truth. And you as a Christian, you need to display the truth. You need to be a man or a woman that loves God's word. God loves his son. God loves his word because his word is about his son. Have you ever noticed all the names in the Bible? So-and-so begat so-and-so, so-and-so begat so-and-so, begat so-and-so. What are all the names there? Every single one of them had to do with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, somehow or another. You know, Isaiah 5 talks about the oracles of God. Uh, and But in chapter 5, verse 1, it talks about something else. It talks about, he says, Now I will sing of my beloved a song of my beloved. It's a song about the beloved. Touching my, his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. Look, God came and he gave his son the Lord Jesus Christ. And he planted a seed for, for a plant. And the church is likened to a plant. 
And it needs to grow. And it needs to have fruit. And it needs to spread. And God wants it to be fruitful. And those Christians that are fruitful are beloved of God. Psalm 60 says that he'll protect those that are beloved of God. Uh, look, I, I've seen God protect me. Um, I was uh, I was street preaching the first year in Bible school. And uh, there was a lawyer that was trying to sue Dr. Ruckman and the school to keep him from preaching in front of Rosie O'Grady's downtown. And uh, we went down there in defiance of, of the lawyer and his uh, gang of thugs that was down with him. And they were thugs. And they were, uh, they were uh, uh, kicking people. They were shoving the people that were passing out tracks. And I got up to preach, and I, I don't even remember what I preached. And I got down off the truck, and these two big burly men were approaching me. And one of the brothers that knew karate, he got up in front of me and says, I'm a black belt. I don't think you want to do this. And one of the guys had a knife. They were going to knife me. And God sent that brother to protect me. I know God protects his beloved. But you know, so many Christians, they neglect their Bible. One time Spurgeon uh, had a woman come to him and, and um, he, uh, he spoke to her about her soul. And she told him uh, that uh, she felt that uh, she had a desire to serve God. Um, but she found another law in her members, she said. Uh, Mr. Spurgeon then led her to a passage in Romans and read to her, The good that I would, uh, I do not, and the evil which uh, I would not, that I do. And she said, Is that in the Bible? I didn't know it. Well... Then she got a scolding. He said, you know more about your ledgers than your Bible. You know more about your day books than the Bible and what God has written down. Many, he said, many of you people out in my congregation, you'll read a, a novel from beginning to end. What have you got? A mouthful of froth when you have done with it. Uh, but you cannot read the word of God. That solid, lasting, substantial, satisfying food goes uneaten, locked up in a cupboard of neglect. While anything that man writes, a catch of the day is brutally devoured. I guess he thought a lot of the word of God, didn't he? Man greatly beloved does. Or a woman greatly beloved. Song of Solomon. Turn to Song of Solomon. Now, that's a book too many Christians don't preach from, preachers. It's about a relationship between a man and, and, and his beloved. The ancient Jews wouldn't let people read this book till they had gotten of age. But it says there in verse number 3, chapter 2, Psalm Solomon 2, verse 3, there's a lot of beloved in this book. It was hard to choose. But he says here, he says, as the apple tree among the trees of the wood, talking about Solomon, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, Banner over me was love. This gal here, she thought a lot of old Solomon. Matter of fact, Solomon was her favorite person in the whole wide world. He was the bridegroom. She was the bride. Well, my friend, you're part of the bride. We sang that song, Do the Gates of the City in a Robe of Spotless White. He will lead me where no tears were. That's talking about the day we go up and to the new Jerusalem and we get married to the Lord Jesus Christ as his bride, man. But you ought to be delighted with him down here. You you ought to be, you ought to be, boy, I can't wait. Uh, even so, come on, come on, Lord, I want to see you. I want to be with you. I want to I, I want to go to heaven with you. I want to be there. You do that because you're delighted in him. The lady who wrote just as I am, one of the verses says, all I need in him I find. The lady here, this book here, the Song of Solomon, 
she thought highly of him. Yeah, she, she said, every time I get around you, it's like going to the banquet eating house. You're just a buffet, you are. A buffet of love. Well, Jesus can be a buffet of love to you, Christian. You know, God doesn't want to do nasty things to his He doesn't want to chase his children. He doesn't want to take you over his knee. He wants to love you. He wants to comfort you. He wants to be with you. He wants to have a, a love feast. He, he wants to put the banner over you, which is love. Oh, Matthew, Jesus said this when he was, uh, what, or John said this, uh, it says, when Jesus, when he was baptized, went straight away out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened upon him, and he, meaning John, saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven, that's God speaking, saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God's happy with Jesus. Ephesians 1, 6, to the praise and glory of his grace, wherein he hath made it accepted in the beloved. You know why you're saved and can't lose your salvation? You know why you're going to heaven? Because you got Christ and you're accepted in the beloved. He's the beloved of God and you're part of him and he's part of you. So uh, you, if you take that in your life and you express that in your life to the furthest extent you can, you're going to be greatly beloved. You're going to think a lot of his word. You're going to think a lot of his person. You're going to be one of those Christians that can't wait to get alone in the prayer closet and get to be with him. You, you're going to be one of those people that, that seek God out on a regular basis and, and fellowship with him. Oh, there's nothing better than fellowship with the Savior. Sometimes you'll laugh, sometimes you'll cry, sometimes you'll shout. Secondly, Daniel had a godly standing. A godly standing. In Daniel chapter 10 verse 19. This angel said unto him. And said O man greatly beloved. Fear not. Peace be unto thee. Be strong. Yea be strong. And when he had spoken to me. I was strengthened. And said let my Lord speak. For thou hast strengthened me. Daniel was greatly beloved because he had godly standing. He was just beloved on the fact that he loved the truth and loved, loved God. But, but he stood for God. Daniel was a man that stood up for God. When it came time uh, for the decree to go out that nobody would ask anything of anybody but the king of Persia for 30 days, Daniel went to his, his room. He opened his window toward Jerusalem and he got down on his knees and he prayed against the ordinance. Uh, he, it was against the law to pray. He did it morning, noon, and night. And the Bible says, as he did it four times. As he did it four times. Oh, Daniel, he was always standing up for God. Uh, he stood up for, uh, for God with Nebuchadnezzar. He stood up for God with Belshazzar had his feet. He stood up for God uh, for the nation of Israel, he, he was a standing man. And here, this angel uh, takes him to his feet. He's down on all fours, and he, he finally brings him up on his feet. Now he was an old man by this time. He probably didn't, it probably didn't feel good to be on all fours. Uh, look, I'm only 60, and I don't like to get down on the floor. That's my least favorite place to be. It's hard to get up. Old creaky joints and stuff. Old Daniel was an old man. Yet God lifted him up and, and he, he said, well, how did he stand? He stood in God's strength. And you say, well, how do I stand? You're going to have to stand in God's strength. Now, it's a spiritual strength in our day and time. I've met old men and women of God who couldn't hardly get up out of the chair. Yet they had the strength of God. They were standing for God. Old brother Bill stood for God to the day he died. And he couldn't hardly walk. Couldn't hardly do anything for him. You can believe this or not, but Mike Champito stood for God. He was a man that loved God. You know, standing for God is a choice. This preacher said this one time. He said, what is your choice? If you want your father to take care of you, that's paternalism. 
If you want your mother to take care of you, that's maternalism. If you want Uncle Sam to take care of you, that's socialism. If you want some dedicated communist to take over the government and take care of you, that's communism. We would say slavery. If you want and are able to take care of yourself, that's called Americanism. If you surrender all to Christ and want God to take care of you, that is true Christianity. Of course, you will be called square and extremist, a crackpot, but you'll be set for all of eternity in heaven. That's a good little saying right there. I like it. Daniel had a godly standing. He was standing in God's strength, even though he's an old man. And he was standing in abounding labor. Daniel didn't quit when he got old. He kept serving God in his old age. He had served God since he was a little tight, brought into slavery. See, Jeremiah preached and no one believed him, except one little Ethiopian eunuch guy. And his helper, I guess he had a couple of them. But he had another convert. A little guy named Daniel. Daniel, well, he didn't believe what Jeremiah said until he got over yonder in Babylon. And, it, and he said, oh yeah, he was telling the truth. And for the rest of his life, he worked for God. 1 Corinthians 15. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. Now this is the verse that's familiar with you, but I want to look at it. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 58. Way at the end of the chapter. Last verse of the chapter. If you're going to be greatly beloved, you're going to have to abound in work, God's works. He said this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in what? The work of the Lord. For as much as ye you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Brothers and sisters, this brings me comfort. Sometimes I look up to heaven and I say, God, all this stuff has happened and this has happened and that's happened and, and I've tried to do this and that and it doesn't seem like I'm getting anywhere, Lord. But here the Bible says that if you work for the Lord, you may not see anything. God may not give you a prize of what's going on, but God guarantees you that your labor is not in vain to the Lord. Somebody, somewhere, benefits if you labor for God. But we put out lots of tracts for years. We don't know all the people that's got saved on that track. We will in heaven. You'll be glad you did. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 1. If you want to turn there. Uh, as you're turning there, let, let me read you a story about God's doing God's work. There was a, la a rather lazy student that noticed that uh, a fellow student was always reciting her lessons well and got a good grade. So he went up to this uh, other little girl that was in his class and said, How is it that you always say your lessons so perfectly? She replied, I always pray that I may say my lessons well. He said, Do you? He was kind of surprised. Uh, he said, Well, I'll pray too. So the next morning he got up and he he uh, he couldn't even, uh, and he prayed, and he prayed, he prayed going to school, but when he got to class, he couldn't repeat a word of his lesson. He, he got an ass. So after the class, he went to the little girl and said, uh, I thought you said you prayed before. And I prayed, and I got an F. I, I couldn't say the lesson. I, I couldn't even say one word of it. <laughs> And she said, well, perhaps you didn't study hard enough. He said, I didn't study at all. I, I thought all I had to do was pray about it. <laughs> you need to put some feet to your prayers. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1 says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved. Brother Sharper used to say that all the time. I always like to hear him say that. 
Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, affecting holiness and fear of God. People that are standing for God, they're standing clean before God. I wonder what they'd think at the funeral if I came in my dirty old overalls and my very old boots and, 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 a, and a shirt that was stained with grease and tomato sauce and, and, and my tie all crookedy and my hair all not shaved. They they probably wouldn't think very much of that. But I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a bath. I'm going to shave. I'm going to comb my hair. I'm going to get dressed up in the best suit I got. I'm going to polish them shoes and boots up and I'm going to go there and clean because that's the way you ought to do. Serve God. Greatly beloved. A godly standing he had. And finally, this is most important. His beloved people he will send. God will send wisdom to them. God will send wisdom to you. If you care about being greatly beloved. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 13. Now we're going to look at two verses in Thessalonians, one in Second Thessalonians and one in First Thessalonians. I want to show you something about these Thessalonians. Thessalonians chapter, Second Thessalonians chapter two verse thirteen. Paul said this to them: Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Well, that's 15, 13. Well, we're going to read 15 anyway. But we, in verse 13, but we abound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit. And what? Belief of the truth. And then he tells them in verse 15 to hold fast to the traditions, whether by word or epistle. God's greatly beloved people are people that have absolute belief in the absolute truth of the scriptures. Every single word they believe. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. The word is both chapter 2, verse 13. I want to show you something about these Thessalonians. When Paul came to preach to them, this is what he said to them. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. For this cause, I also thank... For this cause, also thank we God. Don't get it straight. Without ceasing. So Paul says, look, we thank God for you. Without We, we keep thanking God for you. Why? Because when ye receive the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. You know what Daniel had in common with the Thessalonians? Every time he got around the book and read it, he believed what it said. He didn't fudge. He didn't change. He didn't go run into the Greek or Hebrew. He didn't go to the commentary. He didn't look up some preacher that agreed with him. He went to the book. God's beloved people are people of the book. Just like the Thessalonians were. They were people of the book. When Paul came around to preach to them, they, they looked in the scriptures. They studied the scriptures. Them and the Bereans, the Bible says. They just didn't sit around and take it from face value. When, when Paul came around preaching, they said, well, we've got to see if this is what the Bible says. Sure enough, that's what the Bible said. Absolute belief in the absolute truth of the scriptures. And they were willing to to bear the reproach that comes with believing the book. Throughout the ages, even in the Old Testament, people that believe what God said have always borne reproach, have always got a little persecution, has always someone's been unhappy with them. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 says, Beloved, 
Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. See, for 200 and some years, Christians have not been persecuted, especially in this country. Uh, there's been a few uh, dust-ups in the history, but mostly the Christians have won out. Mostly the public's been in favor of the Christian. Even though Hollywood's taken pot shots at us, novels have taken pot shots at us, uh, politicians have taken pot shots at us. For the most part, we've won out today. But, uh, beloved of God, that's starting to change. The Bible says, don't think it's strange when it changes around. Because for thousands of years before that, Christianity was a persecuted thing. You say, well, what about the Catholic Church? They ran in the Middle Ages. Yeah, but they weren't Bible-believing Christian. They were persecuting the Bible-believing Christian. You ever read about the Spanish Inquisition or Red Fox's Book of Martyrs? I suggest you do. Verse 13, but rejoice. And as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. For if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. You know what Jude verse 3 says? Beloved, I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. You know what you need as a Christian? You need a willingness. A willingness. Daniel was willing to do whatever God wanted him to do, no matter what it was. He was first in line saying, send me, here I am. I'll do it. I'll serve you, God. The beloved of God have seen many great things. Wilbur Chapman told of a, a story in his life. Uh, a great sorrow had come to him, which occasioned him taking a trip to the far west. One of his elders, a banker, came to see him. And as he was taking his leave, he slapped a bit of paper into Dr. Chapman's hand. Dr. Chapman looked at the little piece of paper, and he was astonished. The banker had put a check in his hand. He had signed the check. He had made the check out to Dr. Chapman. What he did not fill in was the amount of the check. This millionaire gave Dr. Chapman a blank check. And he said, sorry for, for the inconvenience, but I did not know how much you were going to need, so I just give you this. You just spend whatever you need. He said, of course I didn't use the check. He said, but it was comfortable and a happy feeling to know that I had millions at my disposal. So God has given us a signed check. Philippians 4.19. His resources are unlimited. And the more we draw on him, the better he likes it. Psalm 23 says, I shall not want we shall not want for anything if we serve God. God shall supply our need. Christian, you want to be greatly beloved? I do. Turn to the book of Job. This is the last verse we'll look at. I want everybody to turn there. I want you to I want you to do something. Um, I've heard preachers preach on uh, John 3.16. And They'll tell people wherever it says whosoever, put your name there in the verse. Okay, I've heard people say that. And that seems to be acceptable. It's, it's not really changing the book because you are whosoever. But here, here's something I want you to do. Uh, Job 1.8. This is the Lord talking to Satan up in heaven.
And this is what the Lord told him. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, there is none like him on the earth, in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that fears God and that cheweth evil. Now, see that little phrase there? Hast thou considered my servant? In the margin, why don't you just put there your name? Or can you do that? Wouldn't it be nice if up in heaven, God saying, Hast thou considered my my servant Marcia? Hast thou considered my servant Linda? Hast thou considered my servant Clay? Has thou con I, I mean, boy, that would be thrilling, wouldn't it? To know that up in heaven, your, your reputation was one like Job. Most Christians, in conclusion, live rather dull lives. Much like the world, they eat, they sleep, they pay their bills, they work, they get as much leisure time as they can, they raise their kids, they retire. Thus they are never noticed in heaven. Thus they are never noticed in heaven. I'll say it again, thus they are never noticed in heaven. They're not even known for their prayers. They never make an enemy. They certainly do. Don't get noticed by the devil. How about you? How about you? Daniel was greatly beloved. How about you, Christian? Every head bowed and every hand closed. You'll come to the piano and play just as I am. Stay seated if you want to get your hymn book. Turn to number 375 in the burgundy. We're going to sing this song. What the Lord laid on my heart. Say, well, how does God want me? Just as you are. You don't have to be anything special for God. God, God, God will take you just as you are. He said, this is about salvation. Yeah, but it can be about serving God. There's a lot of this song that touches me. Let's sing it softly. If you need to come down here to pray, just get it out of your seat. Just as I